This exotic looking wasteland on the edge of Manchester city centre is somewhere called Pomona, a place caught between two historic waterways but with a rich and vibrant history of its own. And this exotic looking car park on the edge of Gorton, two and a half miles from the city centre, is somewhere called Bellevue, once a place famous throughout the world. So what happened? So let's start by going back to Victorian Manchester, a time when the city was an industrial hellscape full of poor working class people with such blackened faces, cholera and a bad habit of living on top of one another. Despite what most people in the south of England think however, there were a few posh people living oop north as well, including people determined to bring a bit of class to the area. Like John Dalton, who when he wasn't writing atomic theory or researching colour blindness, was busy helping to set up the Manchester Horticultural and Botanical Gardens in Old Trafford. You see, with all this grey and red everywhere, Victorian city dwellers soon became desperate for a little bit of greenery. And what better way to escape the drudgery of industrialisation than having a walk around something called a public park, which back then was an idea still very much alien to most people. Dalton picked Old Trafford because he astutely saw that the prevailing winds would carry all of the smoke and pollution in the opposite direction, to the east of the city. Only an idiot would put such a large open air attraction in the east of Manchester. <laughs> the botanical gardens inspired a move towards a more lasting open air place, up here on an undeveloped island south of Hume Hall and it opened in the 1840s as Strawberry Gardens. Here, on the banks of the River Irwell, Manchester's main polluted waterway, uh, I mean river. And it had everything an emerging Victorian middle class could ever want, including archery, a firing range, firing range, billiard room, bowling green, and a hedge maze. But its major attraction was its horticulture. No, seriously. There was such an abundance of plant life and green space here that thousands flocked from the overcrowded city just to get some breathing space. Within its first year, it had around 100,000 visitors. Its silly name was quickly changed for more intelligent sounding Pomona Gardens, after the Roman goddess of orchard fruit. The gardens were small, but were within easy walking distance of Manchester and were advertised as a place to enjoy all of the pleasures of a rural fate without the expense of a railway trip. But alas, as well as being a slum-filled workshop of the world, Manchester was also notoriously rainy. So, in 1868, businessman James Riley bought Pomona for a princely sum of £75,000 and went about building indoor facilities too. And so they built this, the Royal Pomona Palace, although not actually a royal palace. In fact, it was a concert hall, the biggest concert hall in the country, almost four times the size of the Royal Albert Hall. Completed in 1875, it could hold between 20 and 30,000 people who could all eat, drink, dance and be merry. Or not, whatever. Unfortunately, like all things Victorian, not everything was so wonderful. With a smattering of imperialist thinking, a splash of British supremacy and a huge dollop of outright racism, the Victorians had developed a habit of displaying things from far-flung corners of the world, including rare animals and, oh yes, people. Exhibitions of people to be prodded and poked were common in England in the 19th century and Mancunians weren't blame free either. 
Upper class explorers and entrepreneurs made huge sums charging poor people to come and look at other poor people who were paid virtually nothing. And so everything was going hilariously well for the owners of Pomona Gardens. Until, across town, trouble started brewing. But first we have to go to Stockport and then back in time a wee bit. There, that's better. Way back in 1826, local entrepreneur John Jennison opened the grounds of his home up to the public from where he and his wife sold fruits and vegetables and they called it Strawberry Gardens. Wait, what? They called it Strawberry Gardens, built an aviary full of birds and charged a mission so that anyone could come and pay to see Jennison's thrush. In 1836, the Jennisons leased a pub in the increasingly industrialised East Manchester suburb of Gorton on a wedge of land between Hyde Road and Kirkmansume Lane. It was here that they developed their pleasure garden idea, including Italian gardens, hot houses, mazes and lakes. Not happy just displaying birds, the Jennisons decided that zoo attractions were the way forward and introduced lions, bears, rhinos and other such animals which are today endangered. Famously, the elephant, an Indian variety by the name of Maharaja, was purchased from Edinburgh and walked, yes walked, all the way to Manchester. By the end of it, Bellevue Zoological Gardens was one of the largest permanent zoos in Europe. At first, ticket prices were too high for most people to afford, and the first visitors could only get there by omnibus, because Bellevue was pretty far to walk from the town. But then came a railway station, and then three more, and soon Bellevue began attracting tens of thousands from across the north of England. Jennison was an astute businessman skillfully promoting his gardens in a blitz of marketing which would put modern day PR firms to shame. You could say his business was the manufacturer of fun. Jennison saw that it made business sense to keep his visitors in the park for as long as possible, preferably all day, like a Victorian IKEA. He did this by stuffing Bellevue with attractions including dance halls, pavilions, historical reenactments and a boating lake with fireworks. There were so many things to do that visitors had to be given maps upon entry. By the end of the 19th century Pomona Gardens had fallen well behind the much more glamorous Bellevue. If they were going to compete they'd have to have something big, something explosive. Sadly, the explosive thing they got was a chemical factory which exploded in 1887 not far away, damaging the palace badly. Faced with declining numbers and now a huge repair bill, Pomona's owners decided to sell and soon this whole area became Docklands for the new and exciting Manchester Ship Canal. No longer competing for custom, Bellevue continued to prosper well into the 20th century. In the 1920s, a man called John Henry Illis took over and saw that the place was becoming a bit antiquated. Did they have humans on display there as well? Jesus. New rides began popping up too, including a scenic railway, dodgems, caterpillar and a ghost train. Then came the Bob's roller coaster, so called because it cost a bob to ride it. Cars racing down its 24 metre drop at 96 kilometres an hour became a frequent and much loved sight on the Gorton skyline. Then came the Second World War, when the site was partially taken over for use as allotments, and food for the animals was severely rationed. As the zoo slowly fell out of fashion, other entertainment fixtures gradually took over as culture became more complex. There was the UK's first purpose-built Greyhound Stadium over the road in the 1920s. Boxing, wrestling, a speedway and several dance halls built to accommodate toe tappers and their big nights out. Like Pomona, a huge dance hall was constructed, this one with the arbitrary regal name of King's Hall, where in the 1960s and 70s featured such acts as Jimi Hendrix, The Rolling Stones and Led Zeppelin, which is actually quite impressive. But the 60s and 70s were a strange time. Bellevue was a frequent haunt of Ian Brady and Myra Hindley, the Moore's murderers, while over in another hall, the innocent bebopper could find themselves dancing away to Jimmy Savile's Top 10 Club.
By the 1980s, society had turned away from zoos, dance halls and rickety old roller coasters. Increasing car and television ownership provided new entertainment sources, and the demolition of many of the old neighbourhoods in the area around Bellevue, and the relocation of many people to places further afield, like Hattersley, spelled the end of the site. Then came another world war. Oh wait, no sorry, it's just the 1970s again. By the 1970s, Pomona's huge docklands had also fizzled out, and then eventually closed. Today the site of Bellevue is occupied by a budget hotel, a bingo hall, and a hell of a lot of tarmac. Part of it was sold off decades ago for housing, with one street Lockhart Close named after George Lockhart, ringmaster of Bellevue Circus for 49 years until his retirement at the age of 90. Pomona became a wasteland and then was reclaimed by nature. It's currently a haven for wildlife and ironically still a much needed green space on the edge of an overdeveloped city centre. One you're not supposed to walk around. For Manchester famously lacking public parks, it'd make an ideal place for new gardens. Perhaps an oasis of plant life next to a regenerated and clean river airwell. Nah, not really. This whole place is owned by Peel Holdings, who want to put apartments all over it. Because if there's one thing Manchester needs more of, it's places to put people, and less things for people to do. Maharaja, by the way, spent his days giving people rides around the park, and then died of pneumonia. His skeleton was then immediately put on display in the Bellevue Natural History Museum on site, because of course it was. Today you can find it in Manchester Museum, still waiting to be given a bit of peace and quiet. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is how Manchester developed two world-famous pleasure gardens on opposite sides of the city, and swapped them both for two... nothings. Alright, thanks very much, bye bye now. What do you think of that? Yeah, it was alright. No pleasing some people.